Okay, so environmental racism, we're going to um, get, we're going to start, first of all, with books to read. And um, this is not Asian American author. Um, this is Isabel Wilkerson. Uh, she is an African American author. And this is Cast, The Origins of Our Discontents. Um, how many of you have heard of this? Okay, well, Olga has heard of it. Um, it is an incredible book. I it's 16 hours, so I am I still have nine hours to go, but it is phenomenal how she takes all the history, um, not all the history, but a lot of history and goes to Hitler and goes through the caste system in India and and shares here. Here's let me just go to this next slide here. So in Hindu. Here is the caste system. So there's four sections. Um, so the the upper class is the the Brahmins, and that's associated with the mouth, and it goes all the way down to the feet. But then uh, below the feet is the Dalit, the untouchables. So these are the people that aren't really considered people. And so what she does throughout this book is she brings in. Um, the different communities from all over the world and talks about how they're all their humans are treated and um and has a story that when mlk went over to india um uh they were introducing him as oh he's he's an untouchable he's like one of us and he was a little bit insulted by that because like i'm mlk what are we talking about here our status in america um and not realizing, okay, well, but you're black. And so black people are not given status. And there, um, she parallels the, the bottom rung, the Dalits, the untouchables as black people in America and shows all the parallels. And she also goes to talk about how Hitler um, looked at America. Oh, they have a good caste system going over there. Oh, they treat um, um, black people as, you know, three fifths of a human. Ooh, that's a good idea. And took a lot, um, shares what ideas um, that Hitler used. And, and so it's just, it's really remarkable how she makes all these different parallels um, with a lot of different cultures. And as I was reading this, I was thinking of the name pronunciation guide. And I was thinking back to when I was in Home Depot and I asked the um, South Asian, the Indian young woman, um, her name was like um, CJ or BM or something. And I was like, oh, you know, what's your, what's your given name? You know, or I can't remember what I said, you know, just, I was just being friendly. And she's like, what'd you say? I'm not, I'd rather not say, or something like that. And I'm wondering when did she come over here and, um, the caste system, I think, is still going. But maybe she was thinking that if she gives me her name, that that maybe would say something about her or something. So I'm not sure. I have to do more research into that. But I was really thinking, oh, that's mm, okay. So that's how that ties in. The caste system, a couple of things I also was learning about is people had postcards. So when they had lynchings, so when they took the slaves and hung them and beat them, and there was an audience, there were people who are really excited to bring their kids as if it were a concert. And uh, there were postcards um, you could share. Thinking about all the things that we don't know about. So Japanese Americans during World War II, how there were these hunting licenses um, and there were heads of Japanese, you know, pictures uh, or just um, sketches of Japanese heads, you know, hunting license to hunt them. And just thinking about all the different parallels that we can take from the caste system and see how we see them now. And so it's, it's, it's quite eye-opening. John Stewart, he has a podcast and does videos about a lot of issues. And uh, this is a, is a great interview with Isabel Wilkerson. Um, and he is very active in a lot of different um, issues. I think he was recently talking about the military and getting helping them get benefits. I do encourage you to uh, read that book. It is very um, dense. So Chinatowns, I just have four of them, but there are more Chinatowns than this. And no doubt there are problems with all of them, I'm sure. But in Philadelphia, they are fighting a stadium. 
this year and New York, a homeless shelter and a mega jail, Chicago, a big casino, and Seattle, a transportation project. In terms of environmental racism, um, Jennifer had defined it really and gave us examples. It's the concept of the minority and low-income communities um, experience environmental harm, such as pollution, natural disasters um, at a higher rate. So let's put the chemical place, you know, where the poor people are and the people of color and let's put the jail, et cetera. Let's start with New York. Oh, there's Kevin. Hello. New York is a very large uh, Chinatown. So San Francisco is the oldest Chinatown and New York has the most people in Chinatown. When I talk to corporate, I talk about how Asians make the highest incomes. And I also mentioned they have the lowest incomes too. Um, because I, I want them to understand, to pay attention to Asians. As I speak to you, I want you to know that one in Asian New Yorkers lived in poverty in 2020. There are a number of different surveys that show that in Chinatown, particularly 25% are in poverty. In Chinatown, talking about Chinese only, the percentage, 70% of them were born in China. 35% of them are without a high school degree. And 60% of them are um, have limited English. And then medium income, 50,000. So I think people don't, don't necessarily get this because it depends kind of where you're at, right? Um, I think a lot of us are middle class. And so we're just around middle class folks. So we're not, we don't know what's out there. So here is Manhattan. And Chinatown is outlined right here. To give you a little bit backstory here. So we already know that it's kind of a low income area. So what happened is there were two uh, Asian women who started catering. I think they're young Asians. They're probably like 30 something. Yeah, they, I guess they fundraised 500,000 and they delivered over 100,000 to these elders. And they really coordinated this because during COVID, a lot of them, just they didn't have money, but also it was hard for them to get anything. Plus things were shut down. This is called the heart of dinner. I want to share this so you can follow them at heart of dinner and heart of dinner um, online. It's just so lovely. So this is the light part of our, of our program. They give handwritten letters with their meals and uh, it was just so great. And they have, so they have people writing um, characters. So there's a whole volunteer thing and you can't read this. I'm going to read this to you. You can, you can help deliver. You can help with the app. You can do handwrite, handwritten notes, bag decorating. So there's all these different ways. And I think that's such a great way to get the community involved, um, to help a lot of the seniors out back to reality here, low income area. There are a lot, here's just the, the, you know, one of the main examples, Christina Yuna Lee, who was killed, stabbed 40 something times. This guy here who is homeless, he, um, followed her in and then stabbed her and killed her. And I think this made me, you know, made the big story. Um, so this is in the New York Chinatown. And there are hundreds of, of these, not all resulting in death, but there are actually plenty of them um, in New York. So there are already six homeless shelters in Chinatown. And there was a proposal for four more and also for the world's uh, tallest jail. So you have, just to set it, set the picture, you have Chinatown during COVID where people hated you know, Chinese people, Hey, you brought, you brought Kung flu and, and blaming and all the hate. And they're, they were also shut down. Nobody wants to go to Chinatown too. Cause they were scared of not going out, which is very fair. So now you add all these other layers on top of food insecurity and financial security, and now, um, safety, and you already have six homeless shelters. There were protests. This one looks pretty well attended. This is actually for for the jail. So what happened with the homeless shelters, they were able to postpone those four. So they're not being built right now. And I guess what happens is one of them was proposed for a best Western. So the hotels, they're starving for, um, in the area for, for business. So it's easy. It's rather easy for the city to rent from them because they want the capacity too. 
So when it's, it's a pretty quick process, so I hear. They're safe for the moment, but as we will learn, it keeps coming back. So here, uh, you know, you look at this, this lady, you know, she looks like she's 90. It makes me so sad. Do not sell out your district. Save our seniors. No new jails. Save our kids. So here I'd like to share with you. So this is in protest of the jail. So this is, I believe it is May 2nd. So they made a human chain. And this is pretty unusual for Asians to make a human chain. Like I've not actually seen that because um, that's not really the way we usually protest. Um, but they were going to break ground. So something, you know, imp important needed to happen. It is the beginning of their last stand, a human chain on Baxter Street, blocking construction crews this morning in Chinatown. From starting work on a new jail, they are desperate. They are livid. Shame on you for making money off the backs of people of color. Evelyn Yang, wife of former presidential and mayoral candidate Andrew Yang, among those arrested. Hearing Mayor Adams, his own words calling this jail institutionalized hate against Chinatown and making the promise last year when he was campaigning to the people of Chinatown that he would not allow this jail to go up if he were mayor. And then going back on his word, how dare you make this promise to people who have suffered so much and then turn your back on them. The new jail at the site of the Manhattan detention complex known as the Tombs, part of the city's plan to close Rikers Island. And you can renovate this, it'll cost much less, and you can achieve the goals everyone wants. A spokesperson for the mayor's office says this administration will always follow the law, and the law says the jails on Rikers Island must close on time to follow the law and protect the safety of the community and all involved involved in this project, this work is proceeding. We have engaged deeply with the community every step of the way, and we are committed to continuing to work with them to limit the disruption of this project. City officials also say the existing building can't withstand the extent of the renovation required, and say council members made clear extending the deadline legislatively was a non-starter. In the global pandemic that we just experienced, for one, every deadline has been changed in some form everywhere in the world. It doesn't make sense that we have to look at this that's carved in stone. It's just unreasonable. But even within that deadline, we feel that the plan that we're proposing certainly can meet the deadline possibly faster and get people off of Rikers Island. Community leaders say they'll be at City Hall tomorrow and the day after to protest, and they'll file a lawsuit if they have to. But what they really want, they say, is for the dialogue to continue with the mayor's office. In Chinatown, Stefan Kim, Channel 7, Eyewitness News. You will be placed under arrest and charged with disorderly conduct. We are here for the small businesses. We are here for our seniors. We are here for our children. We this are here the for New the York next City generation. Police Department. You are unlawfully in the roadway and obstructing when vehicular say, traffic. Mr. Mayor, no promise. Mr. Mayor, keep your promise. Mr. Mayor, keep your promise. Jolene, thanks for sharing about the, um, I had no idea about the homeless shelter in New York. Yeah. Or the are, jail. They, Wait, yeah. or is it both? Both. So they already have six shelters and they, um, but they were going to put in four more and there's so much, there, there are a lot of people who are unhoused who are attacking. So, I mean, I don't see a lot of middle-class because I don't see it doesn't mean it's not there, but there are plenty that I see that are unhoused. So it's, it's pretty frightening. And because I, that also is what happens in Seattle. So some things um, I, <laughs> I was thinking, I was like, oh, I was like, hey, mom and dad, can you picture me being one of those young Asians there? There's only 10 of them like protesting. Um, 
and how bold and it was it was neat to see some physical bodies uh, a lot of protests don't involve you know there's usually not very many in um asian protests and i've never been at one and don't really particularly want to be either um but i think sometimes you need to be it's just it's so sad that there's only like 10 actually i mean there may be more off camera but i've i've done a little bit of research here um and with um I, I've done quite a bit of research and they've done some a good job of giving a lot of information of backstory. And here's what Mayor Adams had said. You know, here's a video of him saying that, you know, well, that's a campaign promise that's not, you know, happening. So um, a little bit, a little bit sad. So I'm going to go back to um, our little PowerPoint. Here is the mega jail. So currently, a and B, there are um, there are two jails or detention centers, and there's actually a third. I don't know what the name of the other thing is, but there's actually essentially three jails already, already in Chinatown, and they want to take these down and build the the tallest one in the world. Um, and if you noticed here, here's an open air roof garden, and then low income housing, and so and the health clinic. And so you're going to have construction right here. And if you think about construction, think about the impact. And here's information about this. So the jail will be uh, as tall as the Statue of Liberty, 300 um, feet. And the demolition uh, will be 10 years of particle matter, noise pollution, asbestos in the neighborhoods. Um, and that senior, senior group, 80 to 100 years old, the what they're going to knock down has a thousand and they're going to put up 886 and eight to 11 billion dollars so here we go i'm particularly concerned about the seniors who live in the senior housing right next to the jail who are 80 to 100 years old um you know with the toxins and asbestos and it's located to one of the green only green spaces the residents use on a regular basis uh, when I think about Seattle Chinatown, there's Hing Hei Park, and you have the seniors in Seattle, there's a thousand seniors, and they're playing ping pong, and they're doing Tai Chi. Uh, so a lot of Asians get out into nature, and, and or just outside, I guess, out into concrete, and uh, then it's going to be dusty and, and dirty. So this mega jail, here's a um, petition. I'll have that tomorrow for you to sign if you wish. Um, and it has a lot of great information about it. There was 11,000 signatures. They're shooting for 15,000. The construction, so the demolition itself would take two years. And all of that, I don't know if you've lived around construction or big construction, it's always dusty. Let alone being right next to it, you have all the trucks and all the employees that are going in and out and there's more trash and there's just more everything. And, and then it's congested in Chinatown. Uh, who The people who normally would go to Chinatown, where, where are they gonna go? Where are they gonna park? Um, and, and to think about that, that's um, seven to 10 years. And, and of course it's, you know, is construction on time? No, and think of all the shop owners, how they're gonna be out. So it's really um, very sad. Seattle, so this is where, we, um, here we are in Seattle. And I thought Chinatown was like three blocks. It's actually a little bit bigger, but barely. So it's called the International District. And I met my mom's friend who actually named it. So I didn't realize that. Um, so there's Vietnamese town and then Japantown is one block. And then the rest is, is Chinese. So it is rather tiny. There's a thousand seniors that live there. To give you kind of the lay of the land here, this was August 5th. There are a lot of robberies, a lot of fires, a lot of, um, there are some shootings. There's a lot of goings on there very negatively. And so this is August 5th, where there were 36, seniors uh asian seniors pushed into a room and then each searched and rob one tried to hide his money but he was beaten close to the brink of unconsciousness 
Um, and they're terror, you know, they're terrified. Um, and I can't remember what year it was. I don't know. It was like 50 years or something. The Wame massacre was a big deal when, um, I don't know if it was gangsters. I can't remember what, what the deal was, but, um, because it's beyond mine, I I've just heard of it, but these are the 80 and 90 year olds. My, my mom knows about it too, but they were, they lived in it. So now you're, you know, you're trapped in this room and this person is beating people. Right. And these, these are super frail people, um, super sad. And, um, there are crimes nonstop. Um, so, and then the mayor has cleaned it up because it was very, there was like a hundred people on the sidewalk selling all their hot goods and their stolen toothbrushes and deodorant and, and things. I'd see it every weekend and, um, I, there's no way that I'd want to walk there. And, um, so it's kind of cleaned up. I don't know where the people went, but, um, they, they do experience break-ins all the time for the, the status of Chinatown, it's still all of the um, glasses, all the windows are boarded up, you know, since COVID because a number of them had to go in out of business because people um, were not going out, but also definitely not going to Chinatown because, because we're blamed for um, COVID. So I, I do feel like Chinatown has, has picked up like businesses, but there's still a ton of crime. One of the gals, um, I met from the Miss Chinatown pageant. So she, they're doing a lot to um, feed the homeless and give out water. So that's kind of, Chinatown is, is suffering in many different ways. Chinatown has been getting smaller and smaller. Uh, we used to have a big thing called the kingdom or big stadium, um, what, which was imploded. And then, so we have the new stadium and that encroached upon Chinatown. And then, you know, every 10 years or so it's encroached, Chinatown gets smaller and smaller. And so it's, it's, it's hurting, um, the Chinese shops and the residents. And so I think this quote here from Betty, Betty Luke, wing Luke's from the wing Luke museum from her letter, these two stadiums do not bring people to eat and shop into the, the, um, the international district. Instead, the international district is used as a parking lot additional loss to, to the businesses because people who are not sports fans who want to go to Chinatown, there's nowhere to, to park. And so they skip the trip, they skip the trip. The central district, the international district is literally boxed in on all sides with constant heavy traffic on Jackson street and on I-5 and two stadiums to the South and the train station and underground transit system. The CID cannot escape the unrelenting toxic airways. And here, uh, I believe this is in Hing Hay Park, where a lot of the seniors hang out um, and also play checkers and mahjong and, and do tai chi. In Seattle, the transit uh, metro, there, there's going to be a connection to, to Ballard. And so the proposal, um, here are the different, the blue are the proposals. And if they go through Chinatown, it's um, impacting 27 businesses and 120 residents and 200 employees and three historic buildings. That's like a direct, not the people that are gonna be impacted, but actually the direct hit. Uh, so there was, uh, for the city council, there was 5,000 public comments. So they were listening. Think that it is gonna be near Chinatown, but I think it's off to the side for now. So it's not in the danger at the moment. But as, as you know, as an advocate, it's never done. It always comes back, but because of the 5,000 signatures. So if you're in Seattle, we still need to keep it going and, and be, be ahead of this because things, um, you, you, things come back. Um, and there, the letter that I will also put tomorrow for Seattle lights show, um, all the encringements. I don't know if that's a word infringements whatever the word is, um, upon Chinatown and how it's getting smaller. So this is a Chinatown, probably in Philadelphia and the expressway, um, is, is planned to impact it too. And then Chicago, um, there's a China, there's a big casino. Um, there were three sites and right now, probably that's not going to be, it's going to be at the other site. But I wanted to just share with you all the different examples 
all these examples, and that was just four that I came up with that are experiences this year. And there, what happens is, you know, if we need to put something undesirable in, or we need to have some cheaper land or something, let's go to the people who don't speak English and who are poor and do not know how the system works. So they won't fight back. So that's a lot of what happens in the Asian communities. I was watching a podcast the other day, the um, Lucky Boys talking about what's happening. And a lot of these things will come back. But I was talking to this, this guy and he's like, you know what? However, I will get my seniors. They don't speak English. That's okay. We've got a translator. People, you know, so he is starting to get his people together and they're starting to figure out, okay, we actually physically need to be there. So kind of hopeful. So that mega jail is, it's, it's a, I talked to some New York people and it's like kind of probably coming. It's not, they didn't break ground, you know, because of the protest, but it's not like, it's not going or it's not, uh, people think it is still going to go just, it's a matter of when. It just makes me sad to see all of these. And, and these are just a few of the Chinatowns. Um, there's also Koreatown and Little Saigons and all the other Asian places. And all, I mean, all the other minorities too. So any thoughts on what we have going here? When I think about this environmental racism, it's like stripping a piece of humanity away. Yeah, um, a, a lot of history. Well, I'm gonna show this other video while the rest of you think of what your thoughts are. This is Seattle. An invisible battle is being fought in Seattle's Chinatown International District. Lines are drawn and redrawn daily between massive development projects and the city's most vulnerable community. Today, Link Light Rail's International District Station is ground zero for the next big debate, one whose outcome will decide the neighborhood's destiny for decades to come. In January of 2022, Sound Transit announced a major light rail extension project that would provide much needed transit opportunities to West Seattle and Ballard, serving thousands of Seattle residents. But every major change has a trade-off. What's being proposed in the Sound Transit 3 um, CID station segment are essentially several different alignments. Um, and these alignments are going to be majorly impactful to the neighborhood, its residents, its businesses, its property owners, its overall quality of life for a large number of years during the construction period. It's a big deal because it's it's so close to the heart and the core of, of Chinatown. And um, I'm concerned about how long the construction will take, how long the street closures will last, and if our businesses are going to survive. This isn't the first time a major infrastructure project has impacted the neighborhood. Our neighborhood has been torn up or bisected or impacted every decade for the last six decades in a row. In the 1960s, the construction of I-5 split the International District in half, paving over businesses and homes. With I-5, we've had to display so many homes and, and buildings, and with the streetcar, a lot of our businesses along Jackson didn't survive that construction. And so I think there's just a fear that like we don't really know the real impacts of this construction, because we, but we've seen it. You know, Similar things happen over time, and so it's just like whenever we feel like we can catch our breath, something new comes, comes up, and we have to you know, um, figure, figure out how to protect ourselves again. As the regional gateway into Seattle's downtown and stadium district, International District Station is the single largest hub in the Puget Sound Transit Corridor, with over two and a half million riders passing through its gates every year. Proximity to the station has transformed the CID from a historically undesirable neighborhood into the most sought after commercial real estate in the city. It's very ironic in a way, you know, this is a neighborhood where people of color, Chinese immigrants, other Asian immigrants, um, and, and people of color for over hundred years have been relegated to living, right? This is where we were only allowed to live in the history of Seattle. The neighborhood also just happens to sit at one of the major transit hubs on the West Coast. I mean, you have ferries, you have heavy rail, you have light rail, you have streetcar, you have buses, uh, and you have cars, and they all sort of intersect right adjacent to the neighborhood. Let's look at the data. The draft environmental impact statement published by Sound Transit details five options for the station expansion. Two proposed station exits along the relatively unoccupied 4th Avenue, and three off of 5th Avenue, with one position diagonally across existing developments. Construction would force major street closures, the displacement and demolition of small businesses, exacerbate parking and traffic congestion, and subject residents to construction noise for 16 hours a day over the next 10 years. In a lot of cases, there's you know, not a lot that we can do in terms of impacting these neighborhoods, but what we can do is to you know, create relationships within the community. 
10 years. Can you imagine that living with construction for 10 years, but also, I, I mean, these shops are already boarded up. I mean, how, so that's, that's Seattle. Yay. <laughs> Any thoughts? What do you think? Well, I'm always wondering how to get the word out to more people about this. I mean, in general, and this is kind of a, a rhetorical question, how how many people aren't aware of what's going on, but but also just the the history behind it? Like um I think it was Jennifer said was talking about um losing our humanity, you know, really getting to the deeper issues of what causes this in the first place. So just wondering. Yeah, I, I really think that, oh, I didn't know about it. I didn't know about it. The only reason I know about it, I go to Chinatown <clears throat> every weekend um, uh, with a big guy by my side. So, um, and during the daytime, but I didn't know about it. The only reason I know is because I'm on these different groups and I'm on the um, the community group, international district community group that does the walks and tries to de-escalate pizza homeless. Um, and if there's a fire, tries to put it out. So that's the only reason I knew about this. And I'm rather involved. So yeah, kind of kind of sad. Well, because I mean, I'm wondering with school starting, high school, middle school, college, is it an opportunity to to get a lot of the teachers to talk about this, these mm. kinds of things. Um, in addition to maybe talking with, and I haven't gone to high school in a long time. When I went to high school, and, I, and I, <laughs> you know, we used to have these clubs. You know, we had the we had the Black Student Union. You know, we 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 had all of these different clubs, and and we would get involved in politics and community uh, issues and things like this, and. Why not to you know try and get some of the younger people involved and and maybe that'll spill over to let their parents know about it and maybe uh, Homo TV could come out and and interview someone about it because I just think people just need they need to know about it and, and they need to know about it in some amount of depth as well to truly understand how how dangerous it is. Yeah, I can see. I feel. Yeah, I can see like a field trip where they go, they go to the Winglick Museum, but mm -hmm. also, you know, get their parents to sign a petition um, and to actually look at the shop owners and see, oh, it's this, whatever, this shop that's been here, cow cow or whatever, that's been there forever, that's, you know, will be, you know, endangered. So yeah, that's a great idea. I just wrote down um, Shoreline, um, public schools, Tanisha, um, mm -hmm the director of equity and family engagement, maybe, um, yeah, connecting with them. Thank you. Well, I had a question and, th and this relates to what I was just saying because it had, because I don't have any kids in high school or anything like that. So I guess the impression that I've gotten over the years, it, when I see parents and their kids doing things, and I'm not saying they don't do meaningful things as well, but I just remember seeing like hundreds of parents you know, at the the annual car wash pancake breakfast, <laughs> you know, thing where they're raising money to to send their kids to a camping trip or Band something. Camp, and, yeah. and, you know, and I'm not saying these things aren't valid experiences, but why why is it that some of these parent groups and their kids can go out and and like you said, go to the wing loop go and learn about environmental racism instead of saying, well, we want to go on a canoe trip up the sound. So we're trying to raise money so we can go and plant some flowers somewhere. You know, I mean, I think there's all kinds of opportunities, but for some reason there's this, when it comes to these types of issues, people want to stick them in the box of, well, that's politics. And I, you know, I don't want to get involved in controversy. You know, this is about humanity. It's not, you know, since when is humanity controversial? But I think it's I think the key though is to get make some valuable contacts within the schools and not not the bureaucrats, but actual teachers. Because if you go, my impression is again, based on past experiences, is 
when you go to try and do something with the school system, you get run, run around all the voicemails and write this email and write, you know, do that and do this. And then you give up and throw your hands up. Whereas I've had way more success because I knew a particular teacher that was teaching a particular class and said, we're going to do it. And I skipped over all that other BS that they put you through. I, not that we need a lot more ideas, but sure. I love it. Sure, I, I can see idea. putting, putting <laughs> together, um, reaching out to teachers and if they have, if they, let's say, let's pretend that somebody has a DEI person at the, the school district or in the school, um, probably just in the district, it'd be great to pull together. Okay. Well, let's think of these, um, field trips. So there's, there's 10, five teachers, 10 parents or something, and a few of us talking about, well, let's talk about some different field trips or different excursions. Um, because, you know, like there's African American Museum too, and also walking on 23rd and just, you know, some of the like, right. the different, yeah. and also talking about, okay, well, this is, this is a black community, this is Japanese community, and guess what? They all could just live here in the Red Line District. And so that's why my mom and um, and the black folks all know each other because they went to school together because they lived together because they could not live in the white areas. And I think having that walking field trip is such a neat um, idea. Mm -hmm. And if they can't walk, I mean, just also some, I, I like the idea of coming up with like a, um, a, a, some sort of excursion. Yes, Jennifer. So a couple of weeks ago, we had our primary and I was volunteering down at, um, it's called Guadalupe. Mm -hmm. And Guadalupe is literally right in like the suburbs of Tempe and Chandler. And Interstate 10 is right there. And I sat in this beautiful like community center, right? And then I, obviously I was talking to different candidates and some of the, uh, the people running for Guadalupe's community council is like our kids that go to Tempe Union School District get forgotten all the time. Like we're just kind of left out of the conversation. And I'm like, what a great activity for science teachers, history teachers to just have their students look around, right? Just pause and look around at things. Wait. And take notice. Oh, like Physically, I got lost of look to around. To be able to connect to them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I might be cutting up. I think I, we've got a storm, so I don't know if I'm... Oh, you're in Arizona. Yeah, my, my relatives yeah. are down there dealing with the monsoons. and it, Well, I, I mean, and it could be fun, you know? I mean, it could even be, you know, I don't know about scavenger hunts or, or just yes! ways... Yes. You know, things where, where it makes it like this little adventure. And, yes. and I remember a friend of mine had a business once where he called it on, on this very spot. And what he did was he took, it could be a street corner, it could have been a park bench, it could have been any kind of very seemingly mundane kind of thing. But then he said, 40 years ago on that park bench is when so-and-so signed this or this happened or that happened. And it really kind of brings history to light because I think, all of us kind of walk through our daily lives not being aware that just across the street something significant might have happened or um, you know whatever I, I learn about a lot of this stuff on youtube and documentaries but not everybody does that gosh i love that the um in the international district in seattle they do they're um, it's only once a year that the japanese japan town because it's only one block and i missed it um i was like half an hour too late um, they do a little tour around the block and talk about the different places. And my, my uncle, um, there's a place called Maneki, Maneki, which I've never been to. My uncle has built stuff like built, like a, there's a restaurant. And then of course my mom and dad were around there all the time. And so they knew people. And, um, I love that idea of doing the, the walk around and the scavenger hunt. It'd be neat to have, um, like 10 different types of excursions. So let's say one for Seattle, but then template this idea so other people can um, think, think about it. And even for um, Asian Pacific Heritage Month and for Black History Month. And I, I love the idea if there was enough time because um, 
I don't, let's see, Judkins Park, let's say, where my grandma lived, and, and then Chinatown are not too far. I'm well, they're kind of far, but I mean, Black and Asian are like right there. So you could step on one side and then go to the Black side, <laughs> you know? So I think that would be so neat to do like a co co tour. Mm. Sure. Love it. I, my dad and I went to a Filipino tour, um, I think it was five years ago, um, and FASA, I think, the University of Washington Filipino Association Club, I think they were running it, and it was really neat because I never, I didn't, you know, thanks to Jim who shares with us, but otherwise, I don't know much about Filipino history, I just know Filipinos, and it was neat to walk around that area with a Filipino eye on it because I've only known the, the Chinese side, so that was neat. Mm. Well, great presentation. Are you, can you send, are you sending your presentation out to some people? What we just saw the PowerPoint and the videos and I could, I certainly spent a lot of time trying to put this together. And then it I ran, should, it should be in the school. That's what I'm saying is that I could see this being taught in a, or at least a, a version of it to, yeah. to, to students and, um, you know, I'm even thinking about, you know, Jolene and I have this welcoming shoreline thing coming up, which is all about community engagement and all this other stuff. I'm just wondering if certain other areas have certain weeks, like in the Central District, the International District, if there's certain events happening where we can kind of piggyback. I don't know if it's setting up a table, a display, because I, I, I was imagining, like, for instance, if hypothetically if you had like an event in the, in the international district or whatever the event might be and then they have a lot of community tables so you at the table you actually have this display that we've just witnessed today but in a in a physical form so people could actually mm -hmm. see on what it easels or however you want to do it however whatever would work so that and people could actually come up and talk to you or whoever and learn more about this so that we already have a built-in audience as opposed to having to go out and try and get people to come watch this or come to a Zoom call. You're going to a place where there's already a bunch of people. Um, yes, I think what is missing at the International District events uh, is, I think sometimes they have booths, but mm. it, you know, to, to be a booth person, you really need a Hey, how's it going? Come here. That's Lita. you. You can so, do that. So I do rock at that. Um, <laughs> but I think the the challenge is like, that's not fun. You know, like who who cares? Or because like, sometimes there are the the people there, but they're not. They're the educators. Mm -hmm. I think what's missing most of the time at community events, and particularly the ones in Chinatown, is an MC who can really mm. have bring people in and like. Actually, I mean all events are missing the MC to really connect the dots and not just mm. announce, but connect why you should care about this thing. Not everything mm. needs to be happy and yay, oh my gosh. Um, mm. Things can be powerful too, if they're connected. So mm. true. Well, maybe you can find a group to kind of collaborate with that's already kind of got the same kind of mission and an MC. I mean, I, yeah. I MC to, so I MC to a Juneteenth event. I've done that. And, you know, I kind of did what you just described. Of, they had some displays and they even had yeah. some performances, performances by there's one woman in particular who did a, like a 30 minute performance of African historical songs and things. So we were able to kind of take history and, and make it, relevant in the present because that those connections are always there and then people are going wow oh i had no idea i didn't know that yeah. so then they might be more inclined to actually do something if they have yeah. if they have knowledge yeah i think people are just not used to having um the connection people people just announce there they are there's the taiko drummers right they're Japanese. Well, and, and, and the groups, I'm not blaming the groups <laughs> yeah. necessarily. Certain groups are very good at coming out and in addition to talk, you know, playing and performing, they can really give you a history lesson in the process. But some aren't. Some won't yeah. 
barely say a word and they just come out and perform you go oh well that was nice yeah but, <laughs> but you don't buy jennifer but but you don't necessarily know the significance of what you just saw you just said oh that was kind of cool yeah so i want i want to hammer into all the events that i it will be involved with the the power of it's just eye candy unless you can understand why it's relevant um, to you out in the audience. Um, just <laughs> you know, it could be so much more valuable if we knew. Um, so yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So with um, let's see, some bad news, but also good news. I let me remember what my we'll good see news the is. bad news first. Yeah, I was gonna do bad news first, but I was gonna, I wasn't gonna let it linger, but I can't remember the good news. But so the bad news just, gosh, this last week, a lot of, a lot of beat downs. Um, and let's see, in San Francisco, they did just have um, a, a rally. So that was good um, because of the, uh, the Asian lady who was just shot. Um, so, so that's good that they had a rally. Um, and just, oh, just, I, I swear, I see two to three murders of Asians every week. Um, and it's just, it's hard. Um, um, at least it's, a lot of times it's by gun now, because mm -hmm. when it's by brick or by some, that's brutal to watch. I mean, I, I'll see it, but, um, but there was something good. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking <laughs> there was the first um, in New York City, there was the first Japantown um, parade. Mm. That was exciting, but there was something more interesting than that. All right. Uh, well, yeah. I'm going to have to jump off, Jolene, but we got to catch yeah. up anyway. I, I had I had COVID for a few weeks, so I had, oh. I was a little bit out of the loop, but now I feel like I'm almost back to normal. Good. Well, that picture you looked. Uh, what, what? What? Whose picture was that? Who? What picture? Looked like some white dude. What white dude? What are you talking about? You had a picture that did not look like you. Who's that? Yeah, was, who's who's that? That's guy? me. No. It's me, but I was playing around with my iPhone app. Oh, okay, because that looks like a white dude. <laughs> that's well, not... well. Watch it now, Jolene. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, well, thanks for, for being here. Um, appreciate it. All right. It. Well, All right great to see everybody. All right. See you later. Bye. Bye-bye.